Welcome to Her Story, a retelling of the biblical narratives featuring women in Scripture, with Joanne Guarnieri Hagemeyer, Grace and Peace Joanne. Hannah's story begins with a Thanksgiving feast, an annual gathering at the Lord's table to enjoy all the Lord provided through the settling of the promised land. Herds and flocks, vineyards and orchards, rippling fields of grain, the rain and the sun, the fruitful seasons, and God's blessing all throughout. We continue that tradition of annual thanksgiving to this day, gathering in a practice of gratitude that is good for our hearts and souls. Each story in this series was originally produced as a YouTube presentation. Links to YouTube, Grace and Peace Joanne blog posts, and the books I've written are all provided below. Has there ever been a time when you found yourself in a group of people who were all enjoying themselves and you felt utterly alone? Maybe unseen, certainly not noticed, and no one knew what you were going through. No one knew what you were feeling. There was just no one there to relate to. It's kind of like going to a party that for you ends up being a test of endurance, not the fun it was supposed to be. And that's at the heart of Hannah's story, found here in 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 20. It's a story that starts out in misery, but it ends in rejoicing. So let's take a look at the outline of Hannah's account. We're going to begin with the context of her story, and then we're going to move into the crisis that caused her so much pain. But in the crisis, there came catharsis, and finally, consummation. So let's begin. There was a certain man of Ramataim, a Zufite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerohim, son of Elihu, son of Toha, son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Nina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, even though Elkanah is described as a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, we know from other records, Elkanah was also from the tribe of Levi, descended from Levi's middle son, Koat, a very important point concerning the future of his famous son, the prophet, judge, and priest, Samuel. Poetites were to care for all the tabernacle's sacred items, including the Ark of the Covenant. And as you can see, the Kohatite clan lived in the general vicinity of Shechem, a city of refuge. Shiloh, where the Tent of Meeting was located, was very close by, so that makes sense. Elkanah, being a Levite, did not own land, but the Levites were given six cities of refuge and their surrounding towns and fields. So Elkanah more than likely pastured his flocks and herds in the land near Shiloh, which would have accounted for all the wealth he needed to support these two wives, especially a childless wife. We can see that Hannah was listed first, so probably she's the first wife, and we know from later in the text this was a love match. Penina is listed second, so probably she was a wife taken on to produce heirs because Hannah, the first wife, could not. Now in Iron Age Israel, and really most everywhere in the ancient world, bearing and raising children was the calling of most women. Becoming a mother established a woman's place in the household with such honor, one commentator said she became a symbol of Israel itself. There's no specific Hebrew law that provided for the eventuality of a wife not being able to bear children. However, in the Hebrew Bible, there is a famous case of the matriarch Sarah providing a surrogate through Hagar to bear Abraham a son. And there's another corollary to the patriarch Jacob, who had two wives. And the less loved had many children, the more loved only two later in life. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts of Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hopni, and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. This is already notable for their time, as chronic hunger was a reality. Archaeology reveals eating meat was a rarity, since flocks and herds were needed for their wool and their milk and their labor. Famines and droughts were not uncommon, and the people lived at a subsistence level. If the crops were poor, they had no other recourse than to hunt and scavenge. By being both wealthy and a Kohatite, 
We're to understand Elkanah was blessed by God, that he had God's favor, and everyone would have respected that about him. The narrator doesn't say which festival this was because the point is Elkanah's family tradition was due to his godliness and his righteousness. Now, Shiloh was about 15 miles from where Elkanah and his family lived, which probably meant a two-day journey each way. Provision was outlined in the book of Deuteronomy to sell the yearly tithes if the journey was too far, and then use the money to provide for a feast once arrived. The intent was to have a banquet with God at the Lord's table as a celebration of God's generosity and blessing. It was also an act of faith to take the best and first of all they had and then consume it, rather than save it or set it aside as their seed and their stud. The foods listed were all evidence of God's largesse. You shall eat the tithe of your grain, your wine, and your oil, as well as the firstlings of your herd and flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And or, with the money secure in hand, go to the place that the Lord your God will choose, spend the money for whatever you wish, oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, or whatever you desire. Did strong drink surprise you? I looked it up. It's described as a liquor made of honey and of dates, of wheat and of barley. Maybe a type of ancient beer, or maybe it's mead. But anyway, strong drink. Once arrived in Shiloh, Elkanah would have secured whatever they needed for their celebration, and considering the size of his family, it must have included an ox or a sheep. There would have been bread made from fine flour, as all the grain offerings outlined in Leviticus required that, The hands, arms, and joints of ancient women show the damage of having to do that heavy labor. This was a costly gift in itself. Now, most likely, the meat would have been cooked into a savory stew with barley and lentils and seasoned with salt and coriander and cumin. And there would have been roasted grains as well, and maybe dried fruit, figs, raisins, maybe dates, and certainly honey. In the same passage that commanded bringing the choicest of the first fruits to God, also enjoined to never boil a kid in its mother's milk. And because meat was the main dish, cheeses and milk would most likely not have been included, though they were a staple of daily life. And finally, it was commanded that portions be given to the Levites, as they did not have any inheritance in the land. As for the Levites resident in your towns, Do not neglect them, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you. Every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns. The Levites, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you, as well as the resident aliens, the orphans, and the widows in your towns, may come and eat their fill, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you undertake. It seems when people offered their sacrifices, they would allow the fat to be burned off as a gift of faith and thanks to God. Then the meat would be boiled in a pot or a cauldron with a portion that went to the priest and the rest of the family to eat. As their feast seems to have taken place just outside the enclosure that held the tent of meeting, and Eli was sitting right there on his bench by the entrance, it is very possible Eli and his sons also ate from this banquet as their portion. I described this feast for you so you can see how expensive it was and how rich the foods were. This is Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner all rolled up into one, exactly as God wanted, for the people to enjoy. Note the language of rejoicing and blessing throughout this passage. Every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns, and so on, so that all may come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you undertake. This is a really important point here. God rejoices both in being generous and sharing joy with us. It really is an act of faith to set aside time and money to simply enjoy with God all that God gives. Whenever we do, our rejoicing in God's blessing also blesses God. And so we have to ask, where in our lives could we intentionally just enjoy what God is giving us? 
as Jesus would later say, enter into the joy of your master. But this moves us into a crisis. Because for Hannah, this yearly festival did not feel like a blessing, not at all. It was a source of great pain. In her own words, misery, great anxiety and vexation, and in other translations, anguish and grief. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Penina and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Now, a double portion does sound like an honor, doesn't it? But not all commentators agree with that translation. Some say special or worthy, but at least one translation says one portion. Perhaps special in some way, but still just one plate. Hannah dreaded this moment. When Penina sat surrounded by her many children and received plate after plate after plate, loaded down with meat and delicacies for all her children. Whether Hannah's plate came first or last, it didn't matter. It would still just be this one plate, because she sat alone. Imagine sitting at a banquet year after year, meant to represent God's overflowing blessing and love and generosity, it would have been so easy to become embittered against the God who did not bless her. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord. She used to provoke her. And therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Penina, who seemed to have it all, still evidently felt threatened by Hannah. In a sense, the narrator might already be telling us the assumption that godliness equaling material wealth and fertility is a false equation. Penina's behavior revealed a distinctly ungodly character, whereas Hannah displayed restraint and humility and virtue despite her low position in her own home. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Now on the plus side, Elkanah knew the value of Hannah and he loved her. Being godly and righteous, he refused, just as Abraham had refused before him, to discard her, even though that would not have been uncommon for his day. And why? Because he loved her. But on the minus side, even though both had grown up in the same culture, Elkanah did not seem to empathize with Hannah's sense of shame and failure and the weight of the social stigma in her day of having no children. Without children, there would be no one to take care of her in her old age or to give her a proper burial. She also mourned the loss of the coveted position of mother in Elkanah's household, along with all the power and the authority and the honor that went with that role. The other wife, the second wife, Penina, even though she was less loved, she was the matriarch of Elkanah's home. These things were driven painfully home, year after year. Elkanah did try to soften it in some way with a special plate for Hannah. But his lack of understanding and his lack of compassion really made it worse. And truly, from Elkanah's vantage, everything was well. He had the wife he loved with full access to another wife to mother his many children, and he was clearly wealthy enough to support his full household. And there's a truth in here, too. It is possible to be right with God and wronged by others. Hannah's circumstances heaped a lot of societal and familial shame on her. To make matters worse, the one person who loved her heaped more shame on her by invalidating her feelings and making her seem ungrateful for his love, for minimizing his love, when in fact he was minimizing her anguish. This was no reflection of God's love for Hannah or God's good purposes for her, but it is so very hard to separate how our world and our people view us and who we really are, to carry a load of undeserved shame and wonder if we truly are shameful things, undeserving of God's love and grace. 
And again, we have to ask ourselves, what undeserved shame might you and I be bearing? And what unworthiness might be whispering in our ears? Jesus whispers another message. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And that brings us to this beautiful moment of catharsis. One year, it was all just too much. Once again, she was crying. Once again, she couldn't eat. And once again, Panina was provoking her beyond endurance. But instead of making a scene, Hannah waited quietly for everyone to finish their meal, and then she went into the place of worship to pray. After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. At the very bottom of her valley, Hannah was ready to make a promise to God. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child. Then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants and no razor shall touch his head. And immediately after making her vow, she experienced not confirmation, but further attack. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. It was fairly unusual to pray silently and to pray without the priest's intercession while at the tabernacle. Yet how easy it is to judge by what you and I see, to jump to the wrong conclusions about a person or a situation and act on those wrong conclusions. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Centuries later, the writer of Proverbs would write, A soft answer turns away wrath. But it was wisdom the godly and righteous Hannah already knew. The change in Eli was palpable. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. And whether he realized it or not, Eli gave Hannah the word from God she was longing for, a word that would reassure her she was noticed, that she mattered, and she would receive the blessing that had long been barred to her. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. And then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. Why did God keep Hannah from having children? Why did God allow Hannah to be hurt year after year? Personal suffering is never meaningless in the life of a child of God. Hannah couldn't know why God, whom she loved and worshipped, would hold back from her what meant so much. You and I ask God to fix it. Take away the pain, answer the desires of our hearts. But as with Hannah, God may have plans to do something through our pain that goes so much farther than our own lives. God changed the course of history through Hannah's pain because she finally came to the place where she could let it go and give to God even this most private, deepest desire. And because of Hannah's willingness to let go, Samuel was conceived and deeply influenced by his mother's life of prayer and faith. Every time you and I suffer, we have a chance to go deeper with God, to trust in the mercy and goodness of God. You and I, like Hannah, can look to God for solutions, bringing to God the pain, the longing, and be willing to let go of it all, content that God is listening and will do what is the very best and wisest. 
Otherwise, the suffering could take us in a different direction, another direction of bitterness and a breach of doubt in God's goodness and personal love for us. So for Hannah, there could be no rejoicing at God's table when she felt rejected by God and bereft of God's favor. When Hannah walked back to the family festival, nothing was changed. Everything was the same, except for her heart. After praying to God, she was happy, not because she knew what God was going to do. She didn't know. What she did know was that God was good. God had listened to her, and God was for her. And there's a truth for us, too. God may have plans to do something through our pain that goes much farther than our own lives. So what pain are we holding on to that we have yet to let go of and to trust God with? Jesus' invitation is for you and me personally when he says, Come to me, all that you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You and I, of course, know how this story goes. This is the consummation of the story. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. And then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived, and she bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. But the truth here is not that God will finally come through with what I've been longing for. Only I can pray deep enough and sacrifice everything. God was continuing to prepare for Messiah as Samuel would anoint David and from David would come Jesus. The point is, God is listening because God loves us. You and I matter to God. Our lives matter. And God is working through all of that to one day restore all things through Christ. Our suffering, just like the hours of grinding daily grade, it's hard. It's exhausting. It hurts. And it leaves lasting marks on us. To give that suffering up to God is a costly gift. And it does matter to God. The truth is, pain is only the middle of the story God is writing. The joy is always yet to come. And Jesus told his disciples something very similar. He said, Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. And so we ask in our own story, we're in the middle of our story still. So what joy are we hoping for from Jesus? Jesus says, your pain really will turn one day into joy. Often in the moment, It is hard to know what to be thankful for when it seems our hopes and dreams are left unanswered or life's load seems way too heavy to hold. In next week's bonus episode, some thoughts on how to navigate Thanksgiving.